anyone who watches crime dramas could reasonably conclude that when someone is murdered, barring bizarre and extenuating circumstances, the case is solved. That is, through high-tech forensics, moral resolve, or simply the near-mythic competence of American law enforcement, killers are ultimately sent to jail. But as an investigative reporter who has worked in one of the most violent cities in the country for nearly 15 years, I can tell you, this is not true. And that is the point of this podcast, because unsolved killings represent more than just statistics. It's a psychic toll of stories untold that infects an entire community. The final violent moments of a victim's life that remain shrouded in mystery. I'm Stephen Janis. I'm Taya Graham. And we are investigative reporters who live in Baltimore City. Welcome to the land of the unsolved. Hello, this is Taya Graham. Welcome back to The Land of the Unsolved, the podcast that explores both the evidence and the politics of unsolved murders in Baltimore and beyond. Today, we're going to be introducing a new segment of the show. It's a way for us to look back into the case files of homicide detectives who worked some of the most surreal, cryptic, and mystifying cases in the city's history. Murder and mayhem that presaged the city's descent into one of the most violent communities in the country. In the middle of it all was former Baltimore homicide detective, Lieutenant Stephen Tabling. Tabling was a lifelong cop who worked his way up into a supervisory role into Baltimore's homicide unit. During his tenure, he dealt with mass shooters, a murder that he solved without a body, and a madman who stormed into City Hall searching for the mayor and in the process shot several people. Throughout it all, Tabling kept careful track of his case files and the evidence, a veritable treasure trove of documentation of the city's struggles with violence and the people and the places where it occurred. To bring these stories to light, Tabling worked with my co-host Stephen Janis to turn these files into stories, a process that led the pair to write two books together, You Can't Stop Murder, Truths About Policing in Baltimore and Beyond, and The Book of Cop, A Testament to Policing That Works. To talk about this, I'm joined by Stephen Janis. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, Tay, glad to be here. So can you just talk a little about the process of working through the case files and turning them into books? It's kind of amazing because we're so used to everything being so digitized today. But Stephen has piles and piles of old files straight from the homicide uh, floor where he worked. He literally carried them home with him. So you see an unusual level of detail in the stuff that he has preserved. And he also preserved news clippings of those cases so you get a sense of how the media was covering it. And also in the case we're reading today, he he has transcripts of interviews with suspects, things I think that give you a much more broadly contextual understanding of these cases. And, and I, I have to say, like, you know, when I met him and he just started dumping this stuff, as a reporter who can barely get a comment out of the present day police department, the history and and the level of detail that I was able to, you know, just sit there and read was just breathtaking. So I think, you know, that's why we're going to read these cases because I think what Stephen's experiences in the cases that he worked tell us about the present is very important because many, you'll see many of the themes of concentrated poverty, isolation, et cetera, played out in these stories and are still playing out today. So uh, I'm just glad that Stephen was such a detailed note taker and kept track of everything and then made it available to us to look at. So now as part of that process, I'm going to be reading selected chapters and posting them on our podcast to add further context to our reporting on the history of violence in our city. Stories that are emblematic of the many themes we've discussed about how a crime should be investigated, how to use evidence to learn the truth, and how the politics of a city sometimes interferes with the work itself, preventing our ability to fully know the truth. Today's case is about an obsession for tabling, lying. It's about a lie told in a coffee shop, no less, that started a massive statewide investigation into the murders of two young women. A case that explores tabling's theory of lying, how to spot it, why we do it, and what can happen when a lie spirals out of control. Stephen, can you tell us just a little bit about this case? Yeah, I mean, this this case was, was amazing because 
there was some um, you know notoriety about this case because I won't give it all away, but it involved a, a serial killer. But how this case ended up in Tabling's lap and, and what, what he ended up investigating and how that investigation turned out, to me, was an exemplar of the politics of homicide, but also something about Stephen that, that, that is very interesting because we would have detailed conversations because remember, and when you hear this case, Stephen was working as a cop before you had DNA, before you had all the so-called CSI technology. He simply had to like rely on his wits and other things. So his take on human behavior is, is both deep and, and revelatory. And, and so in this case, he talks a lot about that. And a lot of the ideas that we discussed together, he, we, I, I sort of outlined. So it's more than just a story about a case. It's a story about the philosophy of an investigator and, and, and how much thought they put into how they approach a case and what they learn about human behavior in the process. So before I start, if you want to read more from the Book of Cop, it's available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. And if you like our podcast and want to support it so we can investigate more cases, please consider buying it. And now onto the story titled The Bigger the Lie, The Bigger the Mess from the Book of Cop. And just a note, I will be providing these insights from the voice and perspective of Detective Tabling. Why do we tell stories about ourselves that are untrue? Why do we exaggerate our achievements and downplay our failures? And why do we, in moments of conversation and exchange, conflate the facts that define our lives to fit the expectations of others? The answer may seem obvious, but it's not. Self-deception is as human as dying. It defines us and in some ways sustains us too. We lie to temper embarrassment or to avoid responsibility for misdeeds. We lie to bolster our achievements and we lie to impress others. It's a richly varied human trait as natural as the stories of mayhem and violence that fill this book. And from this perspective, I have learned a simple lesson about lying, a rule that I have cited more than once but will repeat. The innocent act guilty, and the guilty act innocent. Not always, but quite often. It's an observation I cannot scientifically affirm, but certainly a behavior I have encountered during countless investigations. How do I know? Because I investigated a pretty big case, a murder investigation no less, based entirely on an inexplicable lie told by a cop. A single twisting of the truth that dragged both of us into the wake of a notorious murder case. A spectacular prevarication which put me in the unenviable position of having to beg my superiors not to charge a man with murder because of an offhand remark uttered over a hot coffee and a stale donut. And I assure you, I am not exaggerating. It was indeed a case that involved coffee, donuts, a hypnotist, a lie detector test, and a cop with a big mouth and a penchant for lying that would make Pinocchio's nose visible from space. Tragically, it was also an investigation that started with a horrible tragedy, the grisly murder of two young girls. During the summer of 1973, a motorist exiting I-695, known as Baltimore's Beltway, noticed what he thought were bodies lying in a grassy knoll next to the off-ramp. Soon, investigators were on the scene staring at the remains of two young teens, Peggy Pumpian and Kathleen Cook, both shot in the head, execution style. The case attracted quite a bit of attention. The girls were young, pretty, and their murders brutal. Their untimely deaths consumed the nightly newscasts and even garnered national attention. The fact that no one was immediately arrested for the crime only heightened the public's fascination with the case and put pressure on investigators to solve it. Which is where I came in. I was working in homicide at the time. The bodies were found in Baltimore County, so initially it seemed unlikely the case would end up on my desk. 
that is until something bizarre happened. It was a phenomena I had become accustomed to. Simply put, over time, my career began to adhere to a casework version of Murphy's Law. If it's weird, odd, or simply outlandish, give it to tabling. I'm not sure why and when it started, but it seemed midway through my tenure as a homicide investigator. The crazier the case, the more likely the file folder would land on my desk. So when I got a call about a city cop who was under suspicion for being the so-called 695 killer, I wasn't skeptical, just a bit wary. The top brass wanted me to investigate, and once again, I was tasked with probing the possibility a police officer had committed an atrocious crime. And again, I was being thrown headfirst into the case without warning or a choice. But it wasn't just the odd connection between that crime and a Baltimore City cop that made me anxious. It was the moment I sat down in the deputy commissioner's office for my first briefing on the details of the investigation that precipitated the feeling of dread I often felt when a case seemed fraught with peril from the outset. The lead came from the state police, and there's no other way to write this than to write it. Upon a tip they received about a conversation between two men, a civilian and a city cop, in a donut shop. I'm not kidding. According to the witness, the duo was exchanging stories over coffee at the D&D in a Maryland suburb called Randallstown. The witness was talking about an armed robbery that had recently occurred at a McDonald's located down the street. But then halfway through the conversation, the cop made an incredible claim. You know the 695 killer, he asked me, the man recounted to investigators. They aren't going to catch him. Why not? Because I did it. I shot them. I shot the girls. At first, the witness said he was incredulous. He thought the man was exaggerating. I said, nice joke. What else you got? I'm serious, the alleged murderer said. I thought about committing suicide, but I can't. I don't like what they do to the bodies in the morgue. You're kidding, right? The witness pressed the confessional cop. But the officer was insistent. They'll never catch him because I did it and they'll never catch me. The witness was so shaken that when the conversation ended, he jotted down the license plate number of the confessor and then he called state police and they called my deputy commissioner and he called me. Why? Because, as I already mentioned, the license plate belonged to a Baltimore police officer. That's right, a cop working in the Central District. An unexceptional patrolman turned suspect in one of the most sensational murders in Maryland's history. And now, thanks to a donut shop confession, he was my problem. And as you can imagine, it was a dicey situation. Like I said before, fate seemed to put me first in line whenever something crazy, unexpected, or politically trenchant needed handling. Maybe I was the guy who wouldn't complain, or the cop who habitually kept his mouth shut. I'd like to think I was good at my job. But who knows? The deputy commissioner briefed me about the case in his office. The state police were anxious, he told me. They believed the alleged confession was a solid lead. The case had gone cold. There was public fear to consider. They wanted a suspect. And for now, they had one. A BPD cop. And the deputy commissioner was anxious too. I could always tell. The impassive stare as he delivered my orders with a steady, business-like voice. It all belied nervousness. And of course, his usual admonition when a case was particularly sensitive. Don't screw this up, tabling. Thanks, I thought at the time. Just the vote of confidence I needed.
So with few details other than a coffee-fueled confession, I made a call to the Central District Command. I informed them I needed to arrange a sit-down with the officer, now a suspect in a brutal murder. The odd thing was, his supervisor seemed nonchalant about it. I was confused. This is pretty serious, I told him. The state police are convinced he's a prime suspect. Anyone else I'd be worried, he said. But this guy likes to tell tall tales. The taller, the better. So I'm not surprised. I take it you don't think he did it, I asked. Yeah, he did. And he's Charles Manson, too. Add a few more in while you're at it. Maybe he's a serial killer. The supervisor chuckled. Wow. I was sort of blown away. I know cops like to brag about exploits and self-described heroics, but a guy taking credit for the murder of two teenage girls who hadn't committed the crime? Really? What was in it for him? At the beginning of this chapter, I wrote about the myriad of motivations for lying, self-preservation, avoidance of punishment, the desire not to hurt the feelings of others. But if the commander was painting an accurate psychological portrait of the cop in question, then perhaps I was dealing with an entirely different type of impetus for fibbing. So I arranged for the self-described sociopath to be transported to district headquarters. When I entered the interrogation box, he already looked broken, not like a slick talker. His hair was tousled, his uniform askance, a three-day-old stubble peppered with hints of gray dotted his face. His shaggy eyebrows arched like rabid inchworms as he spoke. It didn't take long for him to fess up. I was lying, he told me when I asked him about the conversation at the donut shop. I made it all up. Why would you do that, I replied, curious and a bit incredulous. Why would you confess to a murder you didn't commit? I don't know, he stammered. We were just telling stories, and I got carried away. Well, you're in a good deal of trouble, I countered. The state police think you're the main suspect, and so does the deputy commissioner. And I think the reason they all believe you is for one very simple reason. You said you did it. Why would you do that? I don't know. I guess I always want to have the best story. He was telling some good stories, and I had to outdo him. I sat stunned for a moment. If what he said was true, I was in charge of a murder investigation prompted solely by the braggadocio of a cop telling bald-faced lies in a donut shop to win an impromptu game of liar's poker, a fraught battle of narrative one-upmanship that had spiraled into something completely wacky, but with possibly serious consequences. Are you telling me you made all of this up? I asked. I know. I know, he stammered. Sometimes I exaggerate a bit. Well, this one was a whopper, I replied. If the disheveled cop who sat slumped in his chair was telling me the truth, then I was dealing with an entirely different motive to fabricate, an impetus that may seem odd in this particular case, but is perhaps the most common catalyst for the inexplicable exaggeration. Ego. The all-too-familiar human imperative to brag, our seemingly insatiable need to embellish our accomplishments, both real and imagined, the hyperbolic impulse and wholly quixotic human behavior that prompts us to depict ourselves in the kindest light possible. It's an even more treacherous indulgence for police. Egos are like psychic bulletproof vests for cops. We bolster them to deflect the slings and arrows that naturally arise from a job that requires arrests, enforcing laws, and occasionally violence. A cop and his or her ego can literally bust down doors and defect proverbial bullets. And so, as seemingly was the case here, get them into a hell of a lot of trouble. Of course, at that moment, I also had to consider the possibility 
that he could be lying, that he was, despite his confession to the contrary, the murderer. Ironic, right? Ironic that I was trying to decide if a self-admitted pathological liar who fibbed about committing a murder was telling the truth. It was one of those absurd dilemmas that often arise during the utterly unpredictable process of policing. How to sort out the facts of a case based solely upon the statements of a suspect who treats the truth like a shot of liquor to be downed quickly but never tasted. At that point, I decided to stop the interrogation. I wanted to size him up, give him a chance to elaborate, so to speak. It's not a technique, just at that moment an instinctive gut reaction to his obvious character flaws. If he was conjuring tall tales, I wanted to see how he would respond under the pressure of silence. He didn't exactly cave, but he did open up a bit. After a couple minutes of me simply staring across the table, he offered to prove it. That is, provide evidence that he was lying about the murder, but telling the truth about the fact he was lying. Absurd. I'll take a lie detector test. Whatever you want, he said, running his hand through a thinning ball of hair that at the moment was standing nearly vertical. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So I bit. Can we get hair samples and do a blood test? Yeah, like I said, anything you want. And what about your service weapon? We want it too. Whatever it takes. You're doing this willingly? Yeah, like I said, whatever it takes. It was an intriguing moment. Watching an apparent world-class braggart turning supplicating and humble, a bold teller of tall tales suddenly remorseful and cooperative. His performance, as unlikely as it seems, was so seemingly earnest, I knew he was telling the truth. As I said earlier, stone-cold killers are smooth liars. They don't break or capitulate or volunteer any information, or better yet, agree to a lie detector test. But even more important, they rarely unravel. Whatever psychological problem prompted him to make the absurd claim he was a notorious murderer had lapsed. Now he was naked and afraid, a man frantically searching for a way out of a predicament of his own careless making. Ego, it's quite a disease. All right, I said, let's get you hooked up. I already had a pretty good sense where this case was going. Nowhere. At that point, based on his statements, I was sitting across from a bad liar, not a killer. But the deputy commissioner had a different opinion. And so did the state police. And when the deputy commissioner wants a case investigated, you proceed even if you think it's a dead end. Which meant blood work first, ballistics tests, hair samples, and finally, a lie detector examination. The blood types matched. Blood found underneath one of the girl's fingertips was O positive, and the cop, unfortunately for him, was O positive too. That didn't help. Bear in mind, roughly 48% of the population is O positive, so it wasn't conclusive, but it did feed into the perception of the top brass that the now remorseful Central District cop was a legitimate suspect. The ballistics did not. His gun, although it was the same caliber, was not the weapon used to kill the girls. His hair samples came back negative as well. A batch of contradictory evidence that offered a glimmer of hope. I could prove he wasn't the guy, but not enough to convince my boss he wasn't. Next, we conducted the lie detector test, a tool we use sparingly, mostly because lie detector results aren't admissible in court, and I think with good reason. Lie detectors compare the variations in physiological responses to different types of questions. An examiner begins the test by asking a control question he or she knows the subject will answer truthfully. For example, 
what's your name? Based upon the physiological response to the control question, the examiner creates a baseline by measuring your blood pressure, pulse, and skin conductivity. Later during the examination, he or she will ask you a direct question about the crime. Did you kill two girls and dump their bodies on the side of a highway? If the subject's physiological responses exhibit a pattern that diverges from the control question, then the theory is the subject is lying. The problem is that lying is an innate ability with varying capability. The capacity to lie is like many humans' talents in that respect. I've known many a hardened criminal who could beat a lie detector test. Some people just have nerves of steel. And conversely, I've known innocents who fail regardless of how innocent they are. The lie detector test is a beatable system which presents itself as irrefutable science and that always made me nervous. Still, like I said, we use it, if only to assess a suspect's willingness to be scrutinized. Anyone who voluntarily agrees to be tested, it stands to reason, has less to hide than someone who won't. Not always true, but mostly true. But it didn't work out as I'd hoped. The results were inconclusive. Not an unusual outcome, but certainly not helpful in this case. Evidently, his talent for lying didn't hold up well under scrutiny. As a result, the deputy commissioner upped the pressure to charge him. I can't say I blamed him at the time. The blood types matched, and we had an oddball confession. Even though I repeatedly told the police commissioner I thought the guy was innocent, he apparently didn't trust my conclusion. He wanted the case closed. So we came up with an idea. I know this sounds offbeat, but we were desperate. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't advocating for this guy. I wasn't his defense attorney. He made his own ugly bed. But what bothers me more than a stupid cop who can't shut his mouth is an investigator wasting time pursuing the wrong man. So we called a hypnotist. I know what you're thinking. What a crock. Why would consulting a hypnotist provide any less or more reliable analysis than a lie detector test? If a seemingly scientific method for detecting deception isn't admissible in court, what on earth could you accomplish using a hypnotist? It's a worthwhile question, and let me try to answer. Technically, the hypnotist is a human lie detector without the aid of the aforementioned physiological cues. The hypnotist minds the subconscious using techniques that makes the subject both self-aware and unconscious simultaneously. The idea is to relax the conscious defenses, the natural barriers that block unfettered truth-telling or remove the psychological obstacles to distinguish between what happened versus what we think happened. It's not a precise science, and it relies quite a bit on subjective analysis, but I trusted the hypnotist we hired. I engaged him before, and he always offered both a useful and frank assessment. Nothing overly precise or too definitive, just a straightforward analysis accompanied with reasonable caveats. I like to call it a spectrum of truthfulness. So I asked the increasingly desperate patrolman if he would try hypnosis. Like I already said, the upper echelon of both the BPD and the state police were breathing down my neck, and none of the evidence thus far had provided adequate proof to convince them he was anything but guilty. Hypnosis was the proverbial Hail Mary, not a total act of desperation, but an attempt to obtain an alternate perspective, an objective opinion that I could use to make my case that our befuddled cop was not a murdering nutjob. Fortunately, he agreed. 
I was present during the hypnosis. It was standard practice for us to observe. I understand that hypnosis isn't necessarily a mainstream policing technique, but you'd be surprised how many investigators turned to it during the 1970s. Remember, we didn't have DNA testing, for example, or many of the so-called CSI technologies. We had to find other ways to wrangle the truth. The cop was given a series of directions, cues accompanied by deep breathing and concentration exercises, along with simple commands associated with them. It wasn't like snap your fingers and stand up and walk. The session was conducted with a more nuanced set of directives, a methodical soothing of the natural defenses of the mind to open up the conscience and pave the way for unfettered recall. He opened up completely, the hypnosis said after the session was over. He was very susceptible. And his assessment? Exactly what I expected. My professional opinion? He was lying. He has no recollection of the killings and even more important, no apparent obvious feelings of guilt, only the remorse that he lied. It seems highly unlikely he killed anyone. In fact, almost impossible. It wasn't incontrovertible proof, but it was something. I had a second opinion from a respected source confirming what I suspected. The gun didn't match. Hair samples were negative. All my instincts hewn over years of investigation told me he wasn't the guy. And the hypnotist seemed equally convinced. While I was waiting for the hypnotist's opinion, I did a little more detective work. I questioned the suspect's family about his penchant for exaggeration. His sister was extremely forthcoming. He's been like that since he was a boy, she told me over the phone. If you tell a story, he's got to tell a bigger one. Any idea why? I just think he's always got to be the baddest guy in the room. I guess he can't help himself. It wasn't new information, but relevant. Whenever you're working on a case as convoluted as this one, it helps to evince patterns, a set of basic underlying facts from independent sources. It's like when you interview witnesses at the scene of a shooting. All their stories will vary in one way or another, but there will be a particular set of indelible facts they all agree upon. I call it communal pattern recognition. And in the case of several independent sources converged on the same irrefutable pattern, my storytelling cop was a pathological liar, but not a killer. Unfortunately, my array of character witnesses and hypnosis didn't impress the deputy commissioner. I was summoned to his office for an update. He wanted the braggart charged and at the very least held in detention. Sir, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm not asking your opinion tabling. If I hold him, I'll have to charge him. And since I don't have enough evidence to charge him, we'll have to release him eventually. I explained to the deputy commissioner how bad that would look, how holding, charging, and then ultimately dropping the case against a cop formally accused of being the 695 killer would appear like we botched the investigation. Even if we had suspicions, there just wasn't enough evidence to prosecute a case in court. Despite his impromptu confession, there was scant evidence that we could bring to trial. And for all those reasons, I strongly advised against doing anything. So just hold him then. On what basis, I asked. The deputy commissioner stared across his desk. He wasn't the type of man who appreciated pushback. It was clear he was taking heat from the state police, and he didn't want to come up empty-handed, particularly when we had a cop who already confessed to the crime. I want you to hold him, he repeated. I think that's a mistake. I'll say it again. I'm not asking tabling. It was one of those no-win moments all too common in policing. My investigation had not produced the results command expected. And worse, I faced the unpleasant dilemma of having to defy a superior or do something I knew 
was simply wrong. I convinced the deputy commissioner to let me call the prosecutor who was handling the case. The idea was to check with him before we did anything. The truth is, if he didn't think the evidence warranted the charges, the case would be over before it began. Fortunately, the deputy commissioner reluctantly agreed. One thing people may or may not understand is that a cop can charge someone, but the prosecutor has the final say. In other words, I can do all the arresting I want, but the prosecutor can ultimately drop the case in court if he or she doesn't think it's up to snuff. So I called the state's attorney who would ultimately be responsible for prosecuting the cop if it ended up in court. I reviewed the evidence with him. I recounted what I had and what I didn't. I provided him an overview of the hypnotist's opinion, the results of the lie detector tests, the blood work, ballistics, and hair analysis. Steve, I don't think we have the makings of a case, he said after I finished. We can't charge him. I know, but the commissioner wants me to hold him. On what basis? I don't know. I can't think of any good reason, personally. I believe he's feeling the heat of the state police. Let me talk to him, the prosecutor offered. And he did. He explained that the state's attorney's office was not prepared to charge a cop with anything, let alone murder, and that holding him without charges was illegal. Ultimately, he informed the none-too-happy deputy commissioner that the case was weak at best, silly at worst. The BPD second-in-command reluctantly agreed charges were not warranted. What could he do? The prosecutor had the final say. Thanks to that phone call, I didn't have to charge the cop with a single crime. It was a relief for me, and not the last time an able prosecutor in the state's attorney's office bailed me out of a sticky situation. I was, to say the least, grateful. I met with the voluble officer to inform him of the decision. He was relieved, even a bit chastened. Thanks, he professed. Thanks for looking out. Don't thank me, I replied. There simply was no evidence. But the case was far from over. Sadly, avoiding spurious charges didn't bring the murderer to justice. About a year later, I received a call from the state police. They'd arrested the killer of the two girls, and it was more bizarre, twisted, and sick than even I could imagine. The killer was a man named Charles Davis Jr. He was the son of a Baltimore County police lieutenant. He was also a part-time ambulance driver. He would stalk his victims, observing them for hours before abducting, strangling, and raping them. Even worse, he would dump his victims' bodies in a public place and then call 911 so he could respond to the scene of his crime. In the end, he abducted and murdered five women. And in almost all the cases, he visited the murder scene in his capacity as an EMT or emergency medical technician. He was caught after a state trooper pulled him over for driving with stolen tags. The trooper found a CB radio in the car that was also stolen. An investigation determined the radio was purchased with a credit card lifted from a rape victim who incredibly survived his attack. Later, she identified Davis as her assailant, and he was charged with forcible rape. Davis, however, fled to Nevada. After he had been extradited back to Maryland to face the rape charges, he asked to speak privately with the trooper transporting him. In the backseat of the state trooper's cruiser, he was advised of his rights and then confessed to killing Peggy Pumpian and Kathleen Cook.
The arrest provided little consolation for me. I was relieved that we had not put the wrong man behind bars. Even if he was a cop who couldn't tell the truth, he didn't deserve to be charged for a crime he didn't commit. As for the deputy commissioner, he never said a word about it. But the simple fact remains that all of it was a horrible tragedy. Beyond my personal relief that we hadn't blown a major investigation, there were five families who had lost loved ones, victims who died the worst sort of sudden and violent death, and a complete sicko and deranged personality who had masqueraded as a first responder while terrorizing our state for months. Still, I think this case taught me a lesson that still applies to my work today. Lying is not a behavioral trait that can be whittled down into an exact science. It's a creative art as unpredictable and unwieldy as any other human predilection, a capability we all possess, but like other talents, exercise with varying degrees of ability, and most important, a behavior that comes with all the diverse array of capacities and capabilities that make human beings so interesting and so dangerous. Thank you so much for joining us for this special episode of The Land of the Unsolved. The bigger the lie, the bigger the mess. As we've said before, this is part of our new series, Cases from the Files of a 1970s Homicide Detective. We will be sharing more of these soon, so please check our podcast page and subscribe if you can. Also, if there is a case you want us to investigate, please reach out to us at our Facebook page, Baltimore True Crime, or you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you so much for joining us again for the land of the unsolved. <laughs>